All right. Hello, everybody. It's Monday, March 4th. We're back at it today. And uh, to kick things off this week, uh, today we are joined by contributing editor at The New Republic and columnist at The Guardian, Osita Nuevo is back again. Osita, welcome. Hey, good to be back. Osita, I guess I just want to begin today with uh, the big news coming out of the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, this morning, uh, Supreme Court overturns Colorado decision removing Trump from the ballot. So uh, Trump will, will be on the ballot. Uh, could, could, you, could you give us some context to this case? It was a unanimous decision, but it was split between liberal and conservative justices on the question of whether the state or the federal government has the right to interpret the 14th Amendment. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I think that's basically right. So it was a 9-0 unanimous decision, basically, that Colorado did not have the right to do this, but there was a split between the conservative majority and the three liberals, and actually Amy Coney Barrett, too. I think her, her concurrence kind of suggested she was mostly in agreement with liberals on, on the question of whether, additionally, um, Congress is the only place where you can have somebody basically disqualify somebody under the 14th Amendment. Um, the liberals argued that all they were asked to do in this particular case was rule on whether or not Colorado had the right to do this. Um, the majority decision said additionally um, that Congress is the only venue in which you can adjudicate the question of disqualification under the 14th Amendment. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that anybody was really surprised uh, that the, the Colorado disqualification wouldn't go through. Um, people raised the specter and liberal, cons- liberal justices agreed with this of states kind of arbitrarily deciding to disqualify people. Kind of argument there is, look, states already kind of enforce election law, basically. They, they rule on all kinds of other disqualification issues. Maybe it's not a stretch to say that on the question of insurrection, they should always also have the power to disqualify people. Um, but overall, you know, the, the question of like who has the power with the 14th Amendment to decide, nobody's really surprised by the fact that the Colorado thing didn't go through. Um, I personally think that a lot of time and effort has been invested into the prospect, again, of getting rid of Trump by some kind of legal mechanism. I, do th- I, I disagree with people who say that, well, it would have been anti-democratic to disqualify Trump. I don't think that's true. At the same time, I, I do think it was wrong to invest as much hope as people have, not just in this particular Supreme Court case, but also all these other trials. I mean, the Supreme Court just delayed indefinitely the the January 6th stuff. Um, the other trials seem in flux on, in terms of whether or not we're actually going to get rulings before the election in November. Um, so the hope that I think a lot of liberals had that the election would be shaped by Trump facing some kind of legal peril or maybe being disqualified or something, I think is kind of fizzling right now. I, I guess like, yeah, like this. So unanimous, unanimous ruling. Trump can stay on the ballot. Um, you know, I'm imagining someone, someone threw their Mueller, she wrote coffee mug across the room today, smashed against the wall. I'm giving so up. Smash so many court. times and glued back <laughs> together again. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's the Japanese art of when you break something, you just sort of reseal it in gold and it becomes even exactly. more valuable. So exactly. just do that with your Mueller, she wrote uh, coffee mugs. But I guess just in, in light of the unanimous ruling, despite the split on who gets to interpret the 14th Amendment, and I'll just note that the court's conservatives decided that its states very much have the right to interpret the 14th Amendment in Shelby County versus Holder. But no surprises here. So I guess I see that like what, I, what I'm interested in is this broader question of despite the fact they're looking for legal fixes to Trump and none have yet to uh, uh, present themselves, at least at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court at the highest level has just, you know, basically cleared the decks for him to continue to run for president. So I guess I'm wondering, like, how what's it going to take for liberals broadly and the Democratic Party more specifically to get serious about what a problem the Supreme Court is? And I'm not even saying that this ruling was wrong. But like it, it is the major impediment to the things that they want, like getting rid of Trump or restoring, you know, voting rights or abortion rights to the nation. I, I have no idea. I wish I knew. I mean, you could say that uh, 2000 should have been the point at which <laughs> people realized the Supreme Court was not always going to uh, work to the advantage of progressives, despite the, you know, the history of things like Brown v. Board and so on. The Supreme Court, people on the left know, and as legal historians know, I think most of them at this point. Uh, has been a mostly reactionary force throughout most of American history. Um, and there's a logic to that. I mean, to, to have a court case succeed, you need time, you need good lawyers, you need all of these resources that are inevitably going to accrue to the wealthiest people in American society. The courts in general are a kind of uh, temperamentally conservative aristocratic institution. You're looking at the past. 
and, and you're looking at kind of legalisms to decide what's right rather than any kind of sort of normative framework. Um, so for these reasons, like, I think it's been wrong to invest as much faith as people had in the courts. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess, I guess there, there's more and more of a slowly dawning awareness amongst liberals now that conservatives have stacked the court, um, that it's now an institution that works mostly to the advantage of Republicans intentionally. That was a project of the conservative legal movement over the last several decades. Um, I think that liberals get that. Whether they get this general point about courts in and of themselves being, you know, suspicious or not worthy of our trust, I think is an open question. Sam Moyne has been pushing this point for some time now. If it's not seeing courts as an institution fail utterly to do anything to disqualify or boot someone out who tried to overthrow the government, if that's not enough to, to sort of erode faith in legalism, I'm not really sure what's going to do it. Well, it seems like, you know, with the specter of Trump, you know, dictator day one, it seems like uh, it's like liberals have taken up the mantle of defending the Constitution, which used to be sort of the province of like libertarians and the right wing. And I mean, I, I, I saw you engage in a little bit uh, on this sort of question of like, how good is the Constitution really? And like, could, could, would we be better off without it at this point? Like, how, how did the, like, the cause of upholding the Constitution become sort of like, a, like the, the rallying cry for liberals and the Joe Biden administration rather than a province of the right wing who are always trying to uphold, you know, property rights, liberty, things of that nature? I think it goes way back. I mean, I think, I think you can think about Brown v. Board and Roe v. Wade and some other things being real moments where liberals convince themselves that aside from engaging electoral politics, battles to win public opinion, you could talk about a Burgerfeld, a gay marriage ruling. There have been these rulings that have convinced a lot of liberals that actually the courts are, the, are a venue for social change. Um, and the Constitution, as old as it is, can be interpreted in ways that um, become vehicles for social change. And again, like I think that we just kind of had a lucky streak uh, the courts have not functioned in this way for most of American history. Um, so I think it goes way back. I mean, you, you think about the Bush administration, all the times people say, well, Bush is violating the Constitution and so on. And, then, and that may well have been true. But I, I, for whatever reason, people have really invested in the idea that courts are a kind of workaround, a kind of shortcut around actually doing politics. Um, and to be fair, you know, somebody who breaks the law as often as Trump has flagrantly, you know, I almost don't blame people for saying, well, ha there has to be something in this toolbox that allows us to do something here. Um, but there hasn't been so far. And, you know, I, I think that it's, 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 it's a way of avoiding politics and more specifically a way of avoiding the difficult questions that are facing the Democratic Party in terms of the erosion of its electoral base, the erosion of its ability to compete in parts of the country that are important to actually winning the electoral college and so on it, it, it's a way to avoid the conversations about what's what's been going on in the, the post-industrial parts of the country the democratic party has failed um if it's the case that courts can actually win these elections for us or rather if it's a case that courts can solve these problems for us we don't have to think about that you know where we have this kind of uh patch or kind of plug in the, in the bottom of the boat that'll keep us afloat for a little while longer before we have to actually address the hard questions they're facing us as a party. I'm sort of, uh, it, like, in terms of the upcoming election, I'm sort of rooting for one possible outcome, which is that Joe Biden loses the popular vote but wins the Electoral College, because <laughs> maybe in that circumstance we could finally get rid of the fucking Electoral College. It's like, that's going to be the only way it's going to happen at this point. It, I, it could well be, unfortunately. Um, when people were talking about that like a year ago, maybe more actively, Biden was, was not doing as poorly in the polls, I think. I think that the, the, the loss we're going to see now is, is going to be both a, you know, a popular vote and a, an electoral college loss if, if things keep trending in the direction that they're, they're heading. Well, I mean, in, in, in light of that, um, I'm wondering if you saw today's uh, big New Yorker article uh, titled Joe Biden's Last Campaign by Evan Osnos. Uh, gives gives a fairly uh, fairly stark look inside the Biden White House and has as they're gearing up for November, and uh, basically the the tenor of people close to Biden and around him is that uh, the polls are wrong and they're they're cool as a cucumber. They could they they couldn't feel they couldn't feel better about their chances going into November. Uh, I'm just wondering if you read that article and your any reactions to it. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I for the last several months I've sort of gotten glimpses here and there of like you know, maybe this is just a, a deep bubble that the administration is in. Maybe they're not listening to people outside the White House. Maybe they're all kind of 
deluded on some level about the reality of the race as it stands right now. And the piece seems to be proof of that. It, it paints a picture of a totally enclosed world where there's one paragraph that I, I posted about that kind of captures it all. Biden's chief of staff was talking to Osnos about the extent to which Biden actually receives criticism from outside voices. And he was like, yeah, yeah, totally. Biden listens to all kinds of people who criticize him. For instance, he just got off the phone with Larry Summers recently. And uh, <laughs> when he's not talking to Larry Summers, he's talking to Tom Frieden. He's talking to Mitch McConnell. So he's getting this wide range of like dissenting opinion. <laughs> uh, you know, so it, it, that, that, that in and of itself, I think, indicates how enclosed things are. And, you know, I, so I actually, it, it's not out yet, but I recently read a review of um, Frank Foer's book on Biden that should be out in the nation soon, um, The Last Politician, which is a, a kind of behind the scenes look at the first two years of Biden's administration. And the picture that that book paints, and the picture that's painted in this piece are different in the sense that you really don't get the an impression that Biden is engaging with progressives uh, or the progressive wing of the party anymore at all. Ron Klain was kind of the liaison between Democratic Party progressives and the administration. He's now no longer chief of staff. And so if it's the case that the people he's really leading on now and looking to it for advice are kind of centrist or even Republicans, um, that could explain <laughs> a lot of things about how the last uh, six to eight months have gone. Um, and also this polling question, virtually every poll from, since the beginning of the year has shown Trump a few points ahead. Uh, there's the New York Times Siena poll um, from just a couple of days ago that said Trump is ahead by four or five points. Um, Biden is now dead even with Trump with women. Uh, he's, he's lost you know, a couple dozen points with non-white voters of color. It's painting a very stark picture, and it's a picture that's not just in that poll. a problem with the methodology people have been trying to pick it apart. You see those kinds of patterns replicating across a lot of polls, both nationally and in the states. And there's no indication in the Osnos piece that the administration is taking any of this seriously. He quotes a bunch of people saying, well, all the polls are kind of wrong. The polling industry doesn't know what it's doing anymore. Um, nobody picks up their phone. Nobody uses landlines. Excuse elderly because of landlines. You know, right, exactly. Like, I buy that. Well, yeah, the thing is, like, some, it's definitely true that the business of polling has gotten a lot harder over the last uh, decade or so, partially because people don't pick up landline phones anymore. Sure. Um, but pollsters have done a lot to try to adjust for that. It's not the case that most polls are only landline based anymore. Um, there's a mix of online stuff and cell phone stuff. And land so they're, they're trying. And also, if you look at the last several elections, David Ferris did this for a slate last week or maybe a week and a half ago. If you look at polls at this point in the year, in February, March, of the last several presidential elections, each of them, with the exception of 2004, um, has ultimately indicated who the winner in November was going to be. They were off by a couple of points. To the extent that they're off, they've actually understated the amount of support the Republican candidate has. Um, so it's not the case the polls say nothing about where the election is. It is still March. There's still time for things to happen. But to dismiss everything out of hand, and then to say, as they have, like, well, actually, you should look at special elections results because those are more indicative. Or you should look at primary results. Those are more indicative. None of that is true. I mean, the, most, the best picture you're going to get, as imperfect as it is, is the polling that's happening right now. And the polling is not good. None of it is good. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing in the Osnos piece that suggests that they, they take, uh, take what they're seeing seriously. Yeah, the arguments with the uh, the polls at this point are weird to me because, yeah, they always bring up that, you know, erroneously that it's only old people that are still answering their landlines, which in that case, they should skew a lot better for Biden. Biden's biggest problems are not with the oldest voters. But I mean, they'll bring up 2022 a lot, which, you know, was the midterms were certainly a surprise for some people. But the polling companies weren't, for the most part, off about the midterms. I mean, Rasmussen and places like that were, but that was a case of just pro like just columnists being wrong, not the polling companies. Also, important to remember, like, Democrats did lose the House in 2022. Like they right. lost it by much less than people expected. Um, but it was directionally correct to say Republicans were likely to take the House. Um, and that's in an environment, again, the th difference between the midterms and the general election is that the midterms bring people out who love to vote. <laughs> people who love, who love going out there and getting their stickers and whatever. They love this, waiting this, online. This, exactly. Signing, so signing things. 
Democrats in, in recent elections, both in midterms and special elections, have done actually kind of well on that basis. General elections, it's just, you know, the general pool of everybody, people who only vote in presidential elections, people who are less frequent voters. Um, and that's where you, you'd expect Democrats to see trouble. It's going to be a different electorate. Um, I just want another, another, another pull quote here from the uh, New Yorker piece. Uh, this is a uh, we're speaking of uh, Biden advisor, Mike uh, Donilon. And it said Donilon's mild demeanor can be dismi- dis- misleading. Like Biden, he has firm beliefs about politics, the public, the press and a contrarian side. In 2020, he and his campaign team had to decide whether to emphasize the economy or the more abstract idea that Trump imperiled the essence of America. We bet on the latter, Donilon said, even though our own pollsters told us that talking about the soul of the nation was nutty. That experience fortified his belief that this year's campaign should center on what he calls the freedom agenda. By November, he predicted the focus will become overwhelmingly on democracy. I think the biggest images in people's minds are going to be of January 6th. And I just like, yeah, talk about people who have checked out. If they think that like November 2024, the biggest images in people's minds will be of January 6th. And not, let's just say, October 7th and everything that happened after that. And then God only knows what images, new images will be created from now until November. But like, once again, coming back to this idea that it's, a, it's the Democrats, like it is, it, is, it is not about just voting. This is about saving American democracy. And no, you don't have a choice to vote for anyone else. Yeah, I mean, the, the image that's going to be most burned into Americans' minds, most voters' minds, is their last paycheck, I think. It's, <laughs> that's, how it tends to, that's how it tends to work in election. I, I just... The flight to abstraction, um, I, I really don't have very much faith in. I mean, their, their interpretation of the midterms was that the democracy message worked, that people came out against Trump. I think there might have been some truth to, that, truth to that, again, because the electorate is fundamentally different with midterms. Um, but here, like, you know, I, I think that people are still angry about prices. I think people are still angry about interest rates, uh, their material... <laughs> Uh, problems that people are having that, that the administration needs to speak to. The, Biden has not put forward anything resembling a second term agenda at all. Maybe he does that this week with the State of the Union. But it's my job to sort of know <laughs> what the administration wants to do, what Biden wants to do, what, what, they, what legislation they want to put forward if they get reelected. None of that work, none of that argument has really happened yet. And so to bank everything on January 6th, it's going to be ancient history, I think, most voters, instead of thinking actively about what can we do materially to demonstrate that we care about the material problems people say that they're facing, say that we care about this foreign policy crisis that we are fomenting and actually exacerbating. You know, I, I think it's kind of delusional. I, I think that one of the, the, the most significant things Biden could do to sort of demonstrate that he is with it and on top of things and capable of exercising leadership would be to shut down the war in Gaza. You know, I think even people who are not necessarily considering themselves, you know, advocates for Palestine and the electorate, do kind of look at that situation and say, Biden is ineffectual. This is a foreign policy situation the United States does not have a handle on. Why is it happening? Why isn't Biden actually bringing things to a close or a settlement? That, that more than anything else, I think, would, would be a turning point. Um, but there's no indication in that, Osmo's piece or any, in anything else, that he's actively willing to do that or consider that. Well, the, I mean, the indication came uh, that they're, you know, at least worried about the branding came yesterday when um, Kamala Harris came out and called for, quote, an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Yeah. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Yeah. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. Saying that Hamas should agree to a, this is from the New York Times, saying that Hamas should agree to a six-week pause currently on the table and that Israel should increase the flow of humanitarian aid into the besieged enclave amid an ongoing crisis. Um, she, Ms. Harris's remarks delivered in Selma, Alabama, bolstered a recent push by President Joe Biden for an agreement and came a day before she was to meet with a top Israeli official involved in war planning, Benny Gantz. Her tone echoed a sharper and more urgent tone coming from the White House and its frustration with Israel grows. Last month, the president called Israel, Israel's response to October 7th over the top. But I mean, I think it's I think it's there in the language here. It's just like they've adopted a more aggressive tone. And I think really what this is, is that they are, it's, you know, they're just sort of rebranding their humanitarian pause as a ceasefire now. That does seem to be substantively what's happened. I mean, the, the position that Harris described in that speech is not different from the position that the uh, Biden administration was describing last month. They used the word pause more often than now they've been pressured into using the word ceasefire. Of course, 
what people want isn't for them to use the word ceasefire. It's to actually make a ceasefire happen. Uh, and, and, you know, the leverage that the United States does have over Israel ought to be used uh, in order to bring that about instead of sort of waiting for conditions uh, that just sort of settle on a ceasefire kind of magically. I don't know. I, I just, I, the, the subsequent position has not changed, but I don't know. If people want to see optimism in the fact that they're now using the word ceasefire and sort of truce or pause, I guess they can. But materially, nothing the administration is doing is actually shifted. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess they're doing airdrops now, but, you know, right. I mean, just spend too me. much time. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about what that yeah. represents. But, uh, see, so, like, so, yeah, Biden has not really put forward a platform or an agenda for what his second term in office would be seeking to accomplish other than preventing Trump from ending democracy. But now, like, when you say that, like, you know, that there's been no real engagement with any material concerns or politics, I think people will, you know, def- def- you know, Partisans of the Democratic Party or supporters of Joe Biden will say things like, well, uh, were you just asleep during the infrastructure bill, the climate bill, uh, the student loan debt forgiveness? I mean, like things like that. They're like, those are material concerns. Like, why aren't you happy? Like, I mean, what would you say? Like, why, why aren't those sort of uh, agenda items like why aren't, why aren't those connecting up to people's lived experience? Or is, is this the media or is this the nature of the bills itself? I mean, I think it's the nature of the bills themselves. I mean, whatever you think about the infrastructure bill, I mean, infrastructure is a kind of long term. <laughs> pro- infrastructure is a long term project. People aren't going to see in their own day to day lives, in their paychecks, at their jobs necessarily. I mean, it's creating jobs in certain places, creating jobs in Michigan. But for the bulk of Americans, um, they're not going to see the immediate benefits of some of that stuff before the election, certainly, and maybe not for a few years. I mean, people. I think want a president who seems attentive to the fact that when they go to the grocery store, rightly or wrongly, they say to themselves, well, look, milk has gone up by this much. Uh, bread has gone up by this much. It is harder for me to pay my immediate bills right now. Um, expiration of pandemic relief programs did not help on this question, right? Um, so, the pres- so people want the president uh, and, and, and Democrats to put forward an agenda, not just, you know, doing the kind of structural things and, and making the kind of structural investments, industrial investments that they've been making over the past couple of years, they want to see immediate, you know, paycheck to paycheck, month to month change in their financial conditions. Um, stuff like was kind of discussed when people were talking about the more expansive version of Build Back Better. Um, you had things like childcare on the table. You had all kinds of social welfare in the conversation that was sort of stripped out as a matter of uh, congressional politics. Um, if I were instructing Biden, advising Biden, if I were granted 15 seconds between Mitch McConnell and Tom Friedman uh, to, to recommend <laughs> him something, I would say, look, like talk about that stuff again, or it's sort of put forward an, a, a, another social welfare agenda that you want to say Democrats will accomplish um, in the next term. And I, I think there's going to be a reluctance to do that for a lot of reasons, partially because all that will ultimately falter on whether, whether Democrats hold Congress in the first place, yes, but also this filibuster question, um, which was not resolved. Biden did not really end up you know, advocating for filibuster reform for more than just the uh, Democratic reform agenda, the, the For the People Act and that kind of stuff. So you know, I guess there's a reluctance to promise things that Democrats kind of feel aren't going to get passed. I don't know. That's that's a hole that they've created for themselves. But if if I were advising the campaign, two big things would be one: end the war in Gaza now, uh, and two: put forward an actual economic agenda that is not just about moving the big piece of the economy and making big investments, as important as that might be. It's about delivering immediate relief to people who say that their economic, uh, immediate financial situations uh, aren't what they'd like them to be. Um, and not just talking up too, like the, the idea that, well, on, on the basis of all these metrics, the economy is booming right now. Might that be true as a matter of looking at, uh, you know, different statistics? Yes. But the voters are telling you over and over and over again, um, they aren't feeling that reality. And, you know, I, I don't think it's smart politics to tell them that they're just deluded, that this isn't real. Trump is not going to say that this is deluded. He's going to say that, yeah, you're absolutely right. Your things suck right now and I'm going to go ahead and fix them. And this guy telling you that you're not suffering is... Is a, is a jackass. Um, I don't know. I, f- I feel like that will probably win 
that uh, that argument. Well, I, I see the seeing as how they're probably not going to end the war in Gaza or tell people that their concerns are valid. Uh, we're, we're stuck with, you know, like a, a, a candidate who's, you know, trailing Trump in the polls, probably like 60 percent of his own voters think he's too old to be president or to be an effective president. And then, like, the question comes up again, can the Democratic Party replace him? And then the answer is always, who are they going to replace him with? And the one I've seen recently uh, call, calls into question the more, most recent example of Lyndon Johnson not seeking a second term because of the Vietnam War. And they're saying they, the point they made, the people defenders of Biden will make, is that Hubert Humphrey lost to Richard Nixon. Uh, do you see any problems with that, uh, at least in terms of the idea of like, why it's impossible to replace Biden at this point? I mean, I, the more relevant thing would be, like, if you look at the polling that people have done for Gretchen Whitmer or Gavin Newsom or Kamala Harris or any of the people who seem like they would be the most likely replacements, um, they don't necessarily do better than Biden right now. But I think that's functionally a matter of name recognition. Like, if you had an actual campaign and these people were out in front of voters, um, my sense is that the support that they have right now might be a floor and they had room to grow, maybe. Um, it doesn't seem to me like people are going to get more comfortable with Biden's age <laughs> as we get closer to the election. It doesn't seem like they're going to get more comfortable with his capacity to lead on that score as we get closer to the election. So, you know, maybe in that sense, it, it would make uh, some strategic sense to, to think about moving to another candidate. The, I think the, the real question is how Ezra Klein put out this idea maybe like a week, week and a half ago about doing a broker convention, just sort of deciding it at the DNC. That could get messy. I don't know. It's all, it, it would be hard for them to do worse than they're doing right now. That's the bottom line for me. So in that sense, they should feel free to experiment or, you know, <laughs> throw someone else out there. I just, I think it would be hard for them to be in a worse position than Biden is right now. So maybe they might as well on that basis consider somebody else. But the reality is that, you know, given what we've seen in that Osnos piece and what we've seen elsewhere, the administration is so insulated from taking the polls seriously, from uh, voter sentiment, that it doesn't seem likely that we're actually going to see replacement happen. There's somebody who is uh, quoted on this question, I think in the New York Times recently, who's literally said sh the word shut up. <laughs> this question, <laughs> shut up. Literally said, shut up. Like, this, this is not a real concern. Biden's with it. He's not, uh, you know, he doesn't have dementia. He's, he's going to inspire confidence as people see him get out there. So shut up and don't talk about this anymore um, because he's the guy. So, you know, if that's the attitude, then I, I don't even know how much sense it makes to, to speculate about a replacement. It doesn't seem like it's, it's going to happen, absent some kind of medical emergency, which is also plausible given Biden's age, I have to say. That's one thing I've th thought about too, actually. I mean, image matters a lot. If Biden were to like fall down or something, or like wind up with like a, like a little bandage on his head, like not even be like seriously injured in any way, but just sort of have some kind of mishap that reminds people, damn, this is a really old guy. That could be it. That could be the election. I mean, we remember when Bernie Sanders had the uh, the bandage right attack. during the primary last day, oh, yeah. a heart attack, whatever. Yeah, it was all this sort of like, well, look at how he looks. He looks kind of haggard. He looks kind of, I don't know. I don't know if he's still got it. Um, if something well, like Biden's that never fallen down before, so I, let's just say <laughs> it maintains that until November. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just think that that, that could that could that could end up mattering. And it really, I don't know. It's 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 hard to say. I don't know. I just think the 1968 example is interesting because like in that election, the guy who would have beat Nixon was literally assassinated. And Hubert Humphrey right. was very close in the popular vote in that election. And also Lyndon Johnson would have lost even harder than he did. And he didn't even lose yeah. that bad. Yeah. Dean Phillips got to watch his back on that score. He could be, he could be our only <laughs> yeah, hope. Don't, and don't go to that ambassador a, hotel, a, Dean. A ball, yeah, ballroom and that could be it, you know? <laughs> What has Richard Nixon ever done for me? Uh, Medicare. No, that was Humphrey's idea. But Nixon, Nixon. Or the bomb, the nuclear bomb. No, no, it was Humphrey's idea to stop testing the bomb. But Nixon. Now, what has Richard Nixon ever done for me? Uh, let's see. Working people, I'm a worker. Nixon ever do anything... No. Humphrey and the Democrats gave us Social Security, but Nixon, that's funny. There must have been something Nixon's done. 
All right. Well, uh, to to move on from the uh, the Democrat Party and and the, the Democratic Party. Sorry, not to be all uh, Fox News here, but uh, to move on from their their woes, impossible defeat in twenty twenty four. To talk about the other side of the equation, the Republicans and the conservative movement. And Osita, like you know, as, as someone who who follows this and 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 we follow it as well, the success of Trump and his I guess MAGA conservative movement has like you know. Uh, expanded the Republican Party coalition beyond some of their more traditional uh, areas, sort of zones of support. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, tr- Trump gaining heavily among Latino voters, but it, it's sort of like a victim, sort of a victim of their own success here as well, because like as it uh, its successes and setbacks politically have engendered a kind of I don't know, like a a, a, a modern right wing conservative movement that is getting weirder by the day. And this is a question that that you posed, I think, you know, like uh, humorously, but I think it's one seriously worth seriously considering is that can the modern conservative movement assimilate into American culture? This is a question that we've been, uh, you know, sort of pondering ourselves as they begin to turn against uh, the NFL, uh, beer, most kinds of food, pop music, and now uh, babes, Uh, Taylor Swift, Sidney Sweeney. Um, It's just... uh, where, where do you, you know, where, where does this come from and what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, this is something I've thought about a lot, uh, more than I've actually written about it, because I think it's so unwieldy and, and uh, kind of strange as a topic, and I don't really know what to make of it yet myself. Um, to the extent that I have touched upon this, it, I think a piece that I did a few years ago, and it was actually one of the last times I was on here, about Sarab Amari and David French, um, the debate that they had over drag queens. Um, for people who don't know or don't remember, Sarab Amari, this conservative writer, uh, logs on to Facebook or something one day. He sees an advertisement for a drag queen story hour happening in California, completely across the country from where he lives. And he says, this is demonic. We now have to get rid of uh, liberal democracy. Um, and he has, he has a debate with David French on the score. And people haven't like followed this or sort of commented upon it in the way that I think they should. But since then, Amari's kind of like backed away slowly from the whole drag queen thing. He's now one of these guys saying, well, actually, Republicans are too focused on wokeness now. We need to be talking about manufacturing. It's it's very much like the hot dog meme thing. Like you did, this. Like you are part, you are part of the main reason why people yeah, freaked is, out is about like Dylan Mulvaney. Rebrand himself as like a New Deal Democrat, kind of. He's he's doing this kind of populist conservatism thing. This kind of we're Republicans, but we believe in using the government to help the working class, supposedly thing. That's that's his shtick now. Um, but in that in that original that iteration of Amari. And that in that debate where you saw people like Adrian Vermeule come out and people who were expressing the old kind of grievances of social conservatism in these new ways, like saying actually America should be an integralist Catholic nation, or you know we should use the government in in, in ways that conservatives had not previously contemplated. People like David French were kind of you know supposed to be the the good righteous for defending liberalism. People that that. The, the tenor of that debate, the fact that people said things were demonic, um, seemed to be like a, a first glimpse, or one of the first glimpses of the turn we we're seeing, where things have gotten more and more unhinged, people are getting more and more troubled and disturbed by uh, increasingly normal and unoffensive things. And I don't know, I, I, f- I think about it in, in a few different ways. First way I think about it is that I think that one of the things that characterizes the right now, the Catholic, the Catholic integralist aside, is that there's been this kind of secularization of social conservative politics. I don't want to overstate that because evangelicals are still powerful. Um, they're still shaping the abortion bait, obviously, and, and abortion policy right now. Um, but when I think back to when I was first learning about politics and I was listening to the gay marriage debate, for instance, back in the mid-2000s, the argument against gay marriage was always, this is in contravention of biblical principle. The United States is a Christian society and on that basis, we have to reject this heathenism, right? Um, the, the leading people you'd hear from were like Pat Robertson and the focus on the family people and the family research council people, um, you know, the Graham family. It was all tethered to the kind of moral majority politics that came out under Reagan. It feels to me now that even when you hear conservatives talking about why they hate transgender uh, identity, why they hate this or that cultural turn, the appeals are more often to evolutionary psychology, mm, yeah. uh, logic, facts, reason, this kind of thing. You're hearing from people like Jordan Peterson, 
uh, who is not a conventional, he's like, a, he's like a psychoanalyst, right? Well, I mean, like, um, ask him if he believes in God and get like a half an hour answer. Exactly. You heard, you heard from in that brief moment from people like Milo Yiannopoulos, who wouldn't have been within, you know, 500 yards of conservative politics in the mid 2000s. Or um, schools. Or, or <laughs> schools. And I've tried to make sense of this because I, I think, that, I think my, one of the things that might have happened there was in the 2000s, conservatives were so, they felt so defeated by new atheism, the Christopher Hitchenses, the Richard Dawkinses. Um, and that oh, that's, kind that, of, that's really sad. If you, if you felt like you got <laughs> right. bodied by the, by that old sot, <laughs> it seems like that's what happened though. Cause the, cause the mode of discourse we hear from Ben Shapiro is exactly the kind of mode of argument you would hear from Hitchens or Dawkins. And the, the kind of, well, if you just sort of think about it logically, and we're not appealing to the Bible, we're appealing to basic reason. That mode of discourse, I think has been appropriated by the right. Um, and it helps that a lot of those same figures now, like Richard Dawkins, um, are now on the anti-woke space. Yeah. Right? So there's been this confluence there. The other thing I think about, too, is the, the institutional collapse of the Republican Party um, and the conservative think tank world. I think most of the people's interpretation of what happened under Trump was Trump comes in as this extraneous figure. He wins the primary. He wins the presidency. And then he sort of sweeps through Republican institutions and installs his people and that represents a real shift in Republican policymaking and thinking. Where the Republican Party is now Trumpist. The Trump has transformed the Republican Party. What I think actually happened is that he wins the primary, he wins the election, and he brings his people in. But he, he's able to bring his people in because the Republican establishment understands that Trump can be utilized and deployed to advance conventional Republican aims. So the biggest accomplishment of the Trump term is a tax cut. Right, this big, long-awaited transformation of American trade is going to fix NAFTA. Doesn't happen. Uh, he deregulates in exactly the way that you would expect a Republican president to. Um, the, his, his convention speech in 2020, he spends a lot of it talking about school vouchers. Right, he's a conventional Republican in all of these different ways. And I think the fact that the Republicans, in the establishment, understood that they could capture him, allowed them to say, "Look, even if we bring in all of these weirdos." We'll let it happen because substantively, whatever they tweet about, whatever they post about, the actual agenda is going to stay functionally the same. So that's allowed for the entry of the Richard Hananias and all these kind of weirdos. You might have seen more resistance to Have there been a real understanding within the Republican establishment or a real sense within the Republican establishment. That these people were actually threats to your actual material agenda. They haven't been. Um, there are all these just hangers on and far right people and racists and weirdos and 4 um, who glommed onto Trump and rode him into positions of influence in the discourse, if not, you know, in congressional offices. I think a lot of these people do work for Republicans in Congress now because the Republican establishment said, OK, we can let these people in. We can deal with them because they're not going to cause too much trouble in terms of the Republican policy agenda. The third thing I think about is um, what I've called the right to be cool question. Yes. I mean, well, see, this one, this one I want to get. Yeah, I really, I really want to get into this idea because it's just like we, something we talked about a lot on the show is like the disparity between the political and cultural power of the right wing. And while their political power is delivering all the same old Republican stuff, like deregulation, tax cuts, or whatever, they, there seems to be more of a demand now to use the power of the government to enforce a kind of cultural parity, which you describe mm -hmm. as sort of a constitutional right to be considered cool. Or to have, or to say Ben Shapiro is as cool as I don't know Taylor Swift or something like that. Yeah, social. I mean, through government or or through just social social norms and and bullying. I mean, so the idea that it's not just enough to have the right to speak freely um, or to think freely. Um, affirmatively, you have to respect us uh, as equals, or as even as cultural superiors. You you have to legitimize. Uh, the fact that we now think that football is, uh, you know, too woke and we don't think Taylor Swift is attractive. We don't think Sweeney Sweeney is attractive. You have to affirm our own grievances and our own neuroses. And I think that this is also kind of tethered in some way to the material Republican agenda. This is all just kind of vamping again, because I've, I've <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, uh, around it myself. But the way I think about it is, most of the anxiety that we're seeing on the right now, we just talked about Sarabamare, about contemporary capitalism, 
this idea that the Republican Party is now going to be a working class party. You know, if you listen to people like Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance and Marco Rubio, because it's going to take manufacturing seriously. We're going to, you know, deliver benefits to workers. Um, most of that stuff, first of all, is not real on a policy le- policy basis. Um, they're not going to, they're not proposing much that would materially affect uh, and improve the lives of, of working people in this country. But two, I think a lot of the angst about capitalism is motivated by the sense that liberals have benefited culturally from the bargain conservatives originally made mid-century, where they said, we're going to do traditional conservatism and we're going to do unrestricted market capitalism. And those two things are going to go together indefinitely. Whereas in reality, corporations that want to make money in the cultural space, or they have to sort of make cultural appeals to people to advertise their products, are going to try to be as broadly appealing to as many Americans as possible. And the majority of Americans are not conservatives. A majority of Americans, uh, you know, like Martin Luther King. There's been this campaign against Martin Luther King that Charlie Kirk has started up in the last couple oh, of months. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see how popular this is going to be. Right. Uh, most Americans, you know, are not hugely, hugely, hugely offended by the idea of recreational sex. Most Americans like football. Uh, I mean, most, most, most Americans, you like know, football, most Americans don't rock, have pop music and babes. I thought like th- right. this is, this is the universal thing about American culture that I thought really both sides could appreciate, but apparently not. I mean, but like so, yeah, they're so, saying, if, if you think Sydney Sweeney is attractive, you are gay. And I saw one guy today said, if you think Sydney Sweeney is attractive, you are spiritually African. When it's right. just like, I, I know, I know, I know this seems like a, a, the new, the new rebranded right wing, but it really is, all of their same neuroses about race and sex, but gussied up now in like kind of, as you said, a, a secular uh, sort of modern academic context. I don't know how you want to, I don't want right. to call it. But Richard Hania is a good example of this. Right. What I was going to say is that, so, so when they realized that actually what was going to happen in the corporate world is that we're going to see gay CEOs and uh, CEOs and executives of color. And you would see, advertisements that are about a multicultural society and you'd see corporations making completely meaningless statements about George Floyd. They were like, well, well, hell, we'll just throw out or we'll, we'll, we'll make noise about throwing about capitalism, right? We'll make noise about standing against corporations. If corporations are going to be woke, if they're going to appeal to liberal culture, we're going to sort of renegotiate or rethink the arrangement that we made. There are people on the outside of actual Republican power politics outside of Congress, outside of the think tanks, who are just sort of ordinary people out there who really, really, I think, are invested in the idea of, yeah, we need to use the power of government to completely reshape this arrangement, bring corporations into into alignment with our social values. People who work in Republican politics, Republican politicians, are not really about this. They they don't want to mess up what they've got with going with Comcast. (laughs) They don't want to mess up what they've got going uh, with the firms that give them money. They don't want to actually make material change. They'll, they'll make noise about, oh, you know, DEI and corporations and, and all of this. But in actual fact, they're not going to do anything. But the thing that they offer to the social conservatives who are really upset is, well, we are going to try to carve out space for you in liberal culture. We're not going to actually change corporate arrangements. We're not going to cost these companies money. But we are going to so, sort of try to bully people into taking social conservatives more seriously as like a cultural matter. We're going to try to sort of uh, create safe spaces for you in the culture in lieu of making any kind of material changes to the arrangements that are shaping Republican politics, right? And so that's where I think the right of the, to be cool kind of functions. It's, it's a fig leaf and a substitution for doing what a lot of social conservatives actually want, which is to bring these firms that are actually very cozy to the Republican Party, in spite of the fact that they make statements about George Floyd, um, under the heel and, and, and subject to actual policy changes. The big exception to that is tech. You have all of this policy conversation about content moderation and censorship of certain things on tech and the extent to which tech is ruining children and so on. And I think tech is the exception partially because it is not as, first of all, it's, it's the relationship with the Republican Party is not built up for as long a period of time as the television and the radio and the conventional media industries. I think that the actual base of people who are working with these companies is is not as uh, traditionally conservative in many cases. The Peter Thiel's and the Elon Musk get all the attention, but like the people who are actually doing the work <laughs> of these companies are not necessarily for the the big uh, social conservative project in many many cases, or that at least they're more libertarian um, than than the people who want to sort of uh, 
ban recreational sex are. So I think that there, there are reasons why tech has been singled out as kind of the scapegoat and the one industry that they're allowed to, to go after. Um, every other big piece of culture is not really finding themselves subject to very much. I mean, Ron DeSantis tried to go against Disney in Florida uh, in this kind of performative way. did not get, I think, that much backup from the Institutional Republican Party. Um, I don't know the, how serious that effort actually was. Disney doesn't seem to have been materially threatened by it in any way. So, you know, I, I think that the right to be cool is kind of functioning as a substitute for what a lot of social conservatives in this weird space actually want to see, which is governments mandating them a girlfriend and cracking down on any company that sort of makes fun of conservatives in any way. Uh, if I could return to a guy whose uh, right to constitutional right to be cool is being viciously trampled on literally every day, uh, you brought up uh, Richard Hanna Barbera as like I think he's a good example of this phenomenon you're talking about of like the secularization of all of the old right wing obsessions and like practically what does that mean? Well, he's a guy who came out of you know online forums of like basically race IQ uh, jargon and. You know, racial supremacy and like a political agenda that basically boils down to uh, stupid people, as I regard them, don't deserve civil or human rights. I think yeah. that's basically the point of the IQ debate. But like, uh, but, but like, but now he's rebranded himself as like, oh, I'm a liberal Democrat now. I support the Democratic Party. I'm arguing. I'm, 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 you know, I'm arguing against race and IQ. But essentially, he still believes all the same things he he used to do. So like. Yeah. How, how does that, how does this trick work in your mind? And like, what are some of the other sort of knock on effects of like secularizing the rights long time obsession with race, sex and things of that nature? Um, I mean, I think that when you when you divorce social conservative grievances, the kind of innate, I don't trust or like people who are different from me, that kind of impulse, when you dislodge it from something like, you know, Christianity and the Bible. And those impulses are just sort of allowed to run wild. They evolve in all kinds of weird and strange directions. Um, and that's why I kind of think is, is, is happening. There's no structure to it anymore. You have people in the conservative movement who are talking about, you know, the, the kind of Bronze Age pervert people, right, who are not about traditional Christianity in some sense, but they, they sort of do this mashup of like, oh, you know, like, well, uh, there's certain things about paganism that were cool, and there are certain things about uh, Catholicism that are cool, and there are certain things about uh, even even Islam <laughs> it, we can sort of like leverage and, and sort of use to make a point about the role women have. Like it's kind of like eclectic, wild, you know, mismatch of different eras where people any, are pining any port for in a storm when it comes to taking any away port the right. Storm, like we want, we want to be Roman legionnaires, and we also want the fifties housewife, and we also want, you know, to stay on the computer and, and have anime girlfriends. Like it's all, it's all kind of unmoored, but I think still fundamentally driven by the same grievances and to a certain respect. I don't know. I mean, I feel like the other thing about this crowd, obviously, is that they're younger. And so all of this is kind of mixed in with this kind of 20 certain thing, 30 something angst about your place in the world and like how many dates you're going on. Uh, say what you will about Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson's politics were not informed by his inability to get a Tinder date, right? <laughs> Richard Hanania. He had a wife. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Richard Hanania, you know, th that, that, the sexual politics there, I think, is being driven substantially by the sense that like recreational sex is bad because they're not having recreational sex with me right now. Um, so I think that, that that's kind of how I understand him. Like it's it, when you, when you've sort of uprooted the thing that made all of this kind of congeal and gave everybody the same script, which was sort of the moral majority Christian uh, evangelicalism. And you just sort of let these kind of like what Lionel Trilling called weird, irritable or irritable mental gestures run wild. Things get weird really quickly. And you have people saying like Sidney Sweeney and Taylor Swift aren't attractive. And actually um, <laughs> you're, you're a homosexual if you think they're attractive. Like it, it, it gets, it gets, it gets odd and strange very quickly. There, there's also like a, a very strong like fissure between more traditionally uh, Christian conservative elements of the Republican party and this new, more like alienated men faction. They they have a lot of dust ups online that are kind of like out of view of most, uh, you know, conservative watchers. But it usually boils down to like the cr traditionally Christian conservative guys saying like, 
if you're complaining about like not getting laid or like not finding a wife or that all women are bad now, like you need to be a good man, basically. And the newer form of conservatives going, all the good women died. There are none left. <laughs> there are no more good women left, fellas. What happened what to Gary do? Cooper? Yeah. <laughs> what happened to Gary Cooper? Exactly. Yeah, along those lines, I remember when um, the Iowa caucus was going on, uh, there, was a, there was a Times article about how like a new strong contingent among Trump voters were people who were considered themselves Christian but didn't go to church. So like, I think there's another, there's another thing going on here, which is just, um, it's, it's not secular, but it's sort of like Jesus without the church. Jesus yeah. without any connection to a religious community and like this, this personal relationship just really becoming, you know, uh, like a, a real tryst. It's just you and Jesus. That's it. No other, no other believers or community, but yeah, like, I don't know, like, uh, I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it's just like an, another, another weird development of uh, right wing politics in this country. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of feel like, um, so if you look at the numbers, church attendance for white working class, um, Americans has gone down a lot over the last couple of decades, which isn't to say that they're like all irreligious or something, but the, like you were talking about, like the way that they experience religion um, is very much not in the way that evangelical, uh, you know, Republicans have, have wanted people to experience religion. Um, and maybe that goes some way towards explaining why they, you know, they were so willing to embrace somebody like Trump in the first place who, you know, was divorced and uh, was in a playboy video or two and, and so on like <laughs> i think i think part of trump's appeal had to have been that he was not part of the same mold when it came to these social questions like yes he would do he'd go through the motions about you know oh the bible is my favorite book actually and uh oh i've always been pro-life whatever like, he, he'd go through the motions of saying that stuff but on a certain level everybody who backed him knew that they, he didn't believe it and and tried to rationalize it in different ways for people who were actually evangelical it was We'll hold our nose because he's going to actually be the person who gets us the court and we can get the court. We can get rid of Orby Wade. And so we'll just sort of ride with him. But for out, people who are outside of that camp, it just, I think I just plain didn't care even normatively that he was lying. It was just, like, this, this guy is a kind of uh, a person who doesn't have these same kinds of social conservative hangups. He'll pretend to, but he doesn't. And, you know, that's, that's more relatable to me than uh, a Mitt Romney was, you know on that level. Like this is, this is somebody who is messed up <laughs> in some fundamental way. Well, I mean, and I, I can relate to somebody who's messed up. I mean, I think like, you know, his, his hypocrisy or his inauthenticity is part of his own authenticity because, you know, aren't we yeah. all hypocrites, you know, like aren't, aren't yeah. we all full of shit in certain way, but also like he, he does represent like an, an, an authentic American religiosity. Like we see, for instance, in a figure like Lauren Boebert, who is a like hard right wing mm, yeah. evangelical Christian, but lives the life of someone who is, Wildly, wiling out of control, party girl, and like there's been some fun stuff with uh with Bobert this week. Um, or Matt Schlepp, who everybody's Matt Schlepp already as well. About. Yeah, it's sort of like you know to 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 espouse you know uh right wing Christianity, but to be in your own personal life totally unchurched, and it's like almost like I was with, with Bobert. It's like if you espouse the right values, like that's the permission you give yourself to like go nuts and be partying every night. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Trump in that respect, I don't think Trump parties as much as, <laughs> as, much no, as Bobert no, no, does. No. no, which is kind of sad. I mean, if you have that much money and you, you're kind of able, allowed to do whatever you want and you're never going to be prosecuted for trying to overthrow the government, you, you deserve, you know, <laughs> a chance to let loose at Mar-a-Lago sometime. But I don't think he does. Yeah, he's, he should, like Andy Cohen. You should be, he should be allowed to do blow with his favorite housewives. Yeah, it's not the same since Epstein left, unfortunately, for him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the, the plug is dried up. All right, uh, Osina, we'll, we'll leave it there for today. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Um, if people would like to uh, check out some more of your work, uh, where should they go? What link should we get, provide to them? They can see my uh, work at the New Republic, uh, The Guardian, um, some other places, but I also have a newsletter at ositawanevu.com. Yeah, where I just sort of write about politics, but also a lot of other things too. And also Flaming Hydra, which I should talk about. I just joined. So it's a writing collective, co-owned, operated by 60 or so writers. Um, one of the new sort of collaborative experiments happening in this extremely bad time in the media. Um, just writers sort of supporting each other and, and writing about cool stuff. So check that out too, if you can. Flaming Hydra. It's got a, got a great name. All right. Uh, we're going to leave it there for today. Uh, I want to thank you once again to our guest, Osina Nuevo. All right. Till next time, everybody. Bye-bye.